This is Pastor Jones here at Valley Assembly of God welcoming you to our midweek service. And uh, we uh, call this a service in which we find rest and encouragement. It's a respite uh, from the hecticness of another week at work, another week of facing the things we're called on to face in our society today. And uh, we trust that tonight's going to be a blessing to you. We are in a brand new series. We've been at now for a number of weeks on the Christian worker. This next segment is going to be three parts, and it's powerful, folks. You will not want to miss one of these. And uh, I am in the book of James, the fifth chapter. And while you're turning your Bibles to that, once again, let me remind you that we're here 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And we're still being very careful, wearing masks, socially distanced six foot. Uh, we come right in and find our seat when we get done after an hour or so. Uh, we, the ushers will ha have you uh, exit, and um, everybody's been safe, and we want to keep it that way. Thank you for your faithful giving, and uh, thank you for your interest in the work of God, and uh, we appreciate it so much. Look with me in that 16th verse of the book of James, the fifth chapter. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, here's, here's the text that we're going to use for these next three weeks. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I want to talk to you about the Christian worker's privilege. The Christian worker's privilege. Many years ago, in England, there was a revival lined up that they were praying and hoping would stir the entire nation. It was the Kenswick Convention. The preachers that were lined up to come and preach were the best of the best in that day and hour. Dr. Wilbur Chapman and Charles Alexander Anticipation was high. And finally the day came when that period of revival uh, started. And one of the attendees that came was a man by the name of John Hyde. As he sat there during that first service, and actually for the next couple of services, there seemed to be there was no anointing. It wasn't that the men weren't prayed up. It wasn't that the men uh, were not studied up. They were. But something was missing. The attendance was not as anticipated. And there had not been one single soul saved in those first few nights of revival. This man, John Hyde, was determined to go home. To go into his prayer closet and begin to intercede and to cry out to God for revival. He would not stop until revival came. So this man, later to be known as Praying Hyde, began to cry out to God. Begin to pray down God's anointing and blessing on that revival. And I want you to know that by his fervent prayers... God literally opened the heavens. The, the auditorium became full. There was an anointing on the messengers. There was an anointing on the services. Souls began to be saved. And revival, true revival, began to break out. There was a move of God. This man, John Hyde, again known as Praying Hyde, was a man that in his own individual life was a soul winner. His first cry to God was, Lord, give me two souls a day. When he began to see two souls a day coming into the kingdom, he said, oh God, give me four souls a day. And then four souls a day came into the kingdom. Could you imagine if every believer had that kind of prayer and determination and one a soul a day, every one of us, a soul every day. How God's church would grow in such rapid fashion. It was his belief that as Christ by prayer would fill him more and more, 
he would be effectively used of God to touch untold number of lives. And you know that's true for you and I as well. As Jesus Christ fills my life and yours, there's no limit to how many hearts and lives could be touched, souls could be saved. Which brings me to our subject matter, and really tonight is more of an introduction to the next two weeks. Because in the next two Wednesday nights, we're going to be talking about the power of prayer, and secondly, the prayer of power. But tonight, this is kind of an introduction to what I'll be saying, but this introduction is powerful, so please, don't wander away, get your Bibles open. And listen attentively to what God has to say. Before we get into it, let's pray. Heavenly Father, may your anointing and blessing reside upon these next three weeks as we talk about maybe one of the most important subject matters that the Christian needs right now, the subject of prayer. The absolute privilege that you've given us as believers to come into the throne room and to bring our request before the God of the universe. Father, I pray you're anointed on your word and your messenger tonight. I pray, God, let hearts and lives be stirred and challenged. And may you have your wonderful way, we pray. We can't thank you enough. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know the greatest privilege which a child of God possesses is the God-given right to prayer. To come into God's presence and to make our request known. Now, do you know why I say it's the greatest privilege? It's even greater, my friends, than, than if you had the ability to communicate with the president. Could you imagine being able to drive down to Washington anytime you wanted to and walk in and talk to the president to share him, share with him your, your, what's on your heart and, and what you think? Or pick up the phone and, and dial up the president? But here's the reality. Neither you or I have that ability. And yet, what a privilege you and I have that at any moment, at any time, we can call on God and God's ear is open to our cry and his hand is extended in our direction. What an enormous privilege. Do you know the new life of which we enjoy has its origin in prayer? You see, it's as you call out from your heart and confessed your sin and cried on God to save your soul that you were born again and you came into the kingdom. So the very origin of the life that surges through you as a believer came to you by prayer. Your growth as a Christian is dependent upon prayer. You show me a man or a woman who's a person of prayer, and I'll show you a man and a woman that's growing in the good things of God. I think in our early years of ministry, where we were working jobs on the side and, and, and pastoring very difficult small churches, trying to get them to grow and trying to make an impact for the Lord. One job I had, I was there at 6 o'clock in the morning. So to prepare myself for the day, I would rise up at 4 I would read 20 chapters in the Bible and spend a protracted length of time in prayer before I ever, ever headed out the door. It was a real time of growth in my life as a believer and as a preacher of the gospel. Friends, as you pray, you will grow in the good things of God. And the believers, listen now, last petition will be prayer. As you commend yourself into God's hands to receive your spirit. Every lack in the life may be traced to a want of prayer. While on the other hand, he who waits upon God shall not want any good thing. Let me talk to you about prayer for a few moments tonight. Laying the groundwork for the next two weeks. First of all. Prayer is the sin killer. You say, what are you, what are you saying? I'm saying that a man or woman that really is a person of prayer, sin will not find a foothold in their heart and life. When Josiah, who came on the scene as a young man who had a heart after God, 
amongst the people who had drifted so far from the Lord, when he began to pray to the Lord, then he put away the abominations which had defiled and damaged God's nation. You read about that in 2 Kings 23, 3 through 8. And what a great leader Josiah had been. Secondly, prayer is the strength obtainer. You need strength in your walk with God to be the overcomer, to be the man or woman of God God has called you to be. It comes by prayer. We see that in the life of Paul. Paul found this out when the Lord assured him in answer to his thrice repeated cry that his grace was sufficient to enable him to glory in his infirmity, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. Even though he had this thorn in the flesh, this thing that was weighing him down, keeping him from doing what maybe he thought he could accomplish in God. God said, my grace is sufficient. And Paul found the needed strength to keep on keeping on. Even though there were times he was at the pole and, and received the lash of the Roman whip, even though he had been stoned, even though he had been shipwrecked, even though he many times was in jail, he just kept on keeping on. Why? God's grace was sufficient, and that grace came to him by his seeking of the face of God. He obtained the strength. Thirdly, prayer is the help giver. It's the help giver. Peter found this out as he was apprehended, put in jail with the intentions of those in authority of that moment in time of putting Peter to death. Sat in that jail cell, shackled with soldiers about him. But the church began to pray. The church began to storm heaven. And God sent an angel, opened that prison door. The shackles fell off and led Peter out until he stood at the door of those people that were praying, knocking and letting them know that God had answered prayer. God brought to him and to the church in that moment of time the help that was needed. We too many times find help by coming to the throne of grace to obtain and to find grace in the time of need. Hebrews 4th uh, chapter in the 16th verse. Number four, prayer is the holiness promoter. Boy, do we need, do we need that today? How many in our churches even know what holiness means today, especially the younger set? They seem they have no comprehension that God said, I am holy, and because I'm holy, ye shall be holy. They don't know what the scripture means when it says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. My friends, prayer is a holiness promoter in the heart and life of believers. Paul recognized this. When he referred to the fervent prayers of Epaphras. That the saints might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Colossians 4 and 12. You see, prayer is the soil in which the plant of holiness ever grows. A man and woman that practice prayer. One of the offshoots or the fruits of that prayer is a life of holiness that reflects God in their hearts and lives. We need some good representatives of the Lord in our society today that would promote some holiness, that live after God, that live different than the world. God's intention has never been that you and I be like the world. We're to be distinctly different. And I pray that we are. And I know prayer promotes that holiness behavior. Number five, prayer is the power conductor. We need Holy Ghost power today. We need a move of God in our midst today. And prayer is the conductor of that power that we need. 
the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the early disciples when they, a Bible says in Acts 1 and 14, continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. What were they doing in that upper room as they waited upon the Lord? Much of the time they were praying. They were crying out to God. They were seeking God's face. In one mind, in one accord, seeking the face of God. My friends, when the wood of our earnest plea is placed on the altar of consecration, then the fire of God's Holy Spirit is going to ignite it in an effectual blaze to the warmth and to the benefit of other people. The Bible says in that 31st verse, when they had prayed. What's your prayer life like? Huh? What, what, how much praying do you actually do? Statistically, people pray not hours, not by the half hours, not by the quarter hours, but a few minutes a day. And you know what, folks? There's not a single believer, hardly, that would not be guilty. And there's not one of us that should not take and carve out more time to spend in God's presence in prayer. Because it's when you pray, things begin to happen. When they had gathered in that upper room, and they were in prayer and in supplication. All of a sudden, the second chapter, there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. A mighty wind. Tongues of cloven fire. And the disciples, the 120, began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. And Peter, who had denied Christ three times, stepped out on that balcony and preached the unadulterated word of God. And 3,000 people came into the kingdom that day. All of that came as a result of them seeking God in prayer. Number six, prayer is the love inspirer. Maybe if America would fall on their knees before God, we could be, as the old song said, give me that old time religion because it makes me love everybody. Don't matter what part of town you come from. Don't matter the color of your skin. Don't matter how much money you got in your pocket. Don't matter how, what kind of clothes you got on your back. God gives you and I as believers the wherewithal to love everybody. Everybody. We need that today. And prayer inspires it. The great grace that was upon the early church which showed itself in the mutual love the saints had for each other was the outcome of the earnest pleading which had gone on before in Acts 4 and 33. That was the outcome. Prayer always brings a good outcome. It's not a waste of time. It's not an effort in futility. Prayer moves the hand of God. Prayer makes a difference. Which brings me to my next point. Number seven. Prayer is the supply receiver. There is an abundance in the food pantry of God's grace for the supply of each and every one of us and the wherewithal to meet every one of our needs. You don't have to go away empty-handed. God's not going to say, well, we've run out. Come back another day like we're doing at the grocery stores right now. No, no. God has everything you need in his pantry. Everything. The only requirement is to bring the key. Listen now is to bring the key of believing prayer to unlock the pantry of God's love and to meet that need in your heart and life. It comes by prayer. The prayer that really believes, that takes God at his word. 
Then the riches of his provision shall meet our every requirement. As Nehemiah found out when he made his prayer unto God. The fourth chapter, the eighth and ninth verse. As he made his prayer unto God, God met the need of Nehemiah as he was endeavoring to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We're trying to rebuild God's church today. We're trying to make ourselves count for God in a lost and dying world that sits in darkness and is in desperate need of a Savior. Where is our help going to come from, folks? It's going to come from the hands of God as we genuinely and earnestly seek his face in prayer. Now, the next two Wednesday nights, we're going to take this a step farther. Next week, we're going to be talking about the power of prayer. And then we will conclude the following week talking about the prayer of power. You'll not want to miss it. Because if there is a need in our churches right now and in your life, is that you and I get back to being real praying people again. You won't want to miss. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we need a revival right now. May we be like a pray and hide and seek your face until that revival comes. May we be like a pray and hide, God, that will believe you to use us to win one, two, three, four souls a day. Bring them into the kingdom. You say it can't be done, and yet, Lord, we know it can be done, not in our power, not in our strength, but by the hand of God through prayer. Lord, we just looked at some of the things that prayer brings to the individual heart and life and to your church and to a society. God, may we be awakened to the power and the potential that resides in prayer. God, I pray that we've just wet our whistle a little bit tonight, and God, even before we get to the next study, May God begin to, we, we begin to pray again like we used to. Lord, if there's somebody in our midst tonight that doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior, my friend, all you have to do is open your heart's door and Jesus will come in. Save your soul, forgive you of your sins, and give you something really worth living for and help you to live for him from this day forward. I pray you'll do that. Now, Father, I commend us into your hands. A few days from now, it'll be Sunday morning. Lay the groundwork for a great Sunday morning worship. And to those that can't attend, may your blessing be upon the YouTube. And God, may some good work be accomplished in this Sunday coming, we pray. Into your hands, we commend ourselves now. We thank you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining with us again tonight. May God bless the remainder of your week. I'm going to look for you Sunday morning. God bless.